नमस्कार सुस्वागतम अभिनंदन केमचो आदाबार राम राम राधे राधे ए वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून आई वेरी वॉमली वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर द फोर्थ डॉक्टर विवा चौधरी मेमोरियल लेक्चर दिस लेक्चर सीरीज वी स्टार्टेड थ्री इयर्स बैक इन द मेमोरी ऑफ डॉक्टर विभा चौधरी who has been a very distinguished physicist of the country and who has a very long association with prl she worked in prl for about two decades she joined prl sometime in 1959 on the invitation of dr sara bai and worked here in the area of cosmic rays my colleague uh, professor uh, vijay sahu will be giving details about this viva chaudhary memorial lecture so we are extremely pleased to have with us today uh, mrs nandini harinath who is currently the deputy director of space operations area at isro's telemetry tracking and command network that is istrac in bangalore which is a very very important uh, center of isro taking care of all the ground support for all the missions and spacecraft operations and she will be speaking to us on a sneak in a sneak peek into few of isro's prestigious missions certainly isro is in in the words of uh, everybody's mouth because of the success which isro has received in the recent years and more particularly with the chandrayaan 3 mission and uh, she is the most apt person to speak about that and we really thank uh, nandini ji for accepting our invitation and to be with us today at this uh, fourth viva chaudhary memorial lecture so before handing over to my colleague uh, professor bijay sahu i would like to also welcome all the participants who are there on the webex panel as well as the prl's youtube channel so once again warm welcome to all to viva chaudhary memorial lecture and now i request my colleague uh, vijaya to kindly tell us about the this occasion on which we are celebrating that is the something about dr viva chaudhary over to you vijaya yeah. thank you prashant varagas for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, dr viva chaudhary Dr. Viva Chaudhary was born on 3 July 1913 and died on 2 June 1991. Worked in PRL during 1959 till 1976, as Professor Anil Hordat mentioned just now. After her schooling in Kolkata, Dr. Chaudhary studied physics at Raj Bajar Science College of Calcutta University and was the only woman to complete M.Sc. degree in the year 1936. She joined the Bose Institute in 1939 and worked with Professor Devendra Mohan Bose. Together, they experimentally observed and published many papers on cosmic rays, which later identified as muons. She studied batches of Ilford half-tone plates that were exposed to cosmic rays at different altitudes. She noticed that the decays. We are caught and likely due to multiple scattering of particles, but no proper conclusions were drawn from this study due to lack of adequate photographic plates at that time in India. Dr. Chaudhary joined the laboratory of Professor Patrick Plackett in 1945 for her doctoral study at the University of Manchester and studied on cosmic rays. Her PhD thesis title was. extensive air showers associated with penetrating particles professor lajos janosi was her official phd supervisor professor blackett won the nobel prize in uh, 1948 in physics for his work related to cosmic rays though it is not clear that how much dr chaudhary's contribution was there you know in professor blackett's uh, nobel prize winning work but she had written a single authored paper in nature on her phd work in 1948 around this time she was also interviewed by the manchester herald in an article called meet india's new women scientist she has an eye for cosmic rays 
Soon after her PhD in 1949, Dr. Chowdhury returned to India and worked at TI for Mumbai till 1957. She was the first woman scientist of TIFR at that time. Then she went to University of Michigan to work as a visiting researcher for a brief time. After returning from the Michigan University, she joined PRL in 1959 as a CSR fellow. She worked on polar gold fields experiment related to cosmic ray air showers at Kodai Canal uh, under, the super, under Dr. Vikram uh, Sarabhai. And after this, she had planned to set up an experiment on simultaneous detection of extensive air showers of cosmic rays and radio frequency emission in collaboration with Dr. R.B. Munsley at Mount Earth. Due to sad demise of Dr. Sarabhai during that time, this project was not materialized. In 1976, she took the volunteer retirement from PRL and returned to her native place, Kolkata. There, she worked for some time at Science of Nuclear Physics. Though she remained unacknowledged during her lifetime for her dedicated work and contributions to particle physics, there are attempts recently to revive her story. In fact, her life has been described in a monograph titled A Jewel on Earth, Viva Chaudhary, by Professor Rajinder Singh and Professor S.C. Roy in 2018. She was honored in 2019 by the International Astronomical Union, IAU, who named a white yellow dwarf star after her name called Viva, which is located 340 light years from Earth in the sextant's constellation. With this brief introduction about Dr. Viva Chaudhary, now I'd like to invite our Dean, Professor Palam Raju, to formally invite, uh, introduce our speaker today's speaker, uh, Dr. Nandini. So may I now request Pulam uh, Raju to take uh, the proceedings. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Vijaya Sahu for the introduction and also telling us about uh, Dr. Biba Chaudhary uh, and, and in, in memory of uh, which we are organizing this uh, lecture series. This is the fourth of uh, fourth one and wherein we honor one of the you know, prominent uh, women scientists who are leading in their uh, fields. Uh, and we had uh, uh, talks in various domains so far. First, second, this is the fourth one. And I'm very happy and uh, uh, pleased uh, to introduce uh, today's uh, speaker, Mrs. Nandini Harinath. She did her MSc from the Delhi University and uh, soon joined ISRO. Uh, and for nearly you know 30 years she had had a lot of experiences with spacecraft uh, designs operations and she had held uh, several key positions uh, in more than 20 satellite missions currently uh, she uh, is holding the position of the deputy director at the space uh, spacecraft operations area in the isro's uh, uh, telemetry tracking and command network center uh, istrac wherein she oversees the tracking and control of all of ISRO's low Earth orbiting satellites and interplanetary missions. And recently, she uh, led the operations at this track, ensuring successful mission operations of uh, Chandrayaan-3 and Aditya L1. In the, in the past, uh, Ms. Uh, Nandini Harinath served as Deputy Operations Director for the Mars Orbiter mission. And we all know that India uh, is the first uh, country that has successfully you know, uh, succeeded in, 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 in the Mars uh, you know, orbit insertion in the very first time. And she led a major role in that attempt. Additionally, as the mission's director uh, for ISRO's uh, first high resolution radar satellite constellation, that is the RISAT 2B series, she led the team uh, to the end-to-end -end operations of the satellites. Mrs. Nandini Harinath has uh, several research papers to her credit, and she has delivered numerous uh, lectures in, to encourage uh, students to take up uh, science and engineering in schools and engineering colleges. And she had also delivered uh, uh, TEDx uh, talk. And and Mrs. Nandini Harinath is a recipient of several awards. Uh, notable among them are India Today Women in Science Award in 2015, 
Kannada Mahila Ratna Award by Kannada Sahitya Parishad in 2017, Astronautical Society of India Space uh, Gold Medal in 2019, and the International Women's Day Award by Delhi Commission for Women in 2023, India STEM Summit Award in 2023, and so on. Along with her team, she won Team Excellence Award for Satellite Recovery Experiment in 2007, Radar Imaging Satellite 1, that is RISAT 1 experiment mission, Mars Orbiter mission in 2014. Further, uh, she featured in a movie by you know, Science Friday, uh, which was premiered on December 12, 2016. It's called uh, Breakthrough, uh, snaps Snapshots from Afar. I really encourage all of you to just Google this and see this, watch this movie. It's very wonderfully uh, done. Uh, when all the women power of uh, India is very nicely displayed. Uh, she is also uh, featured in the book, The Magnificent Women and Their Flying Ma Machines, and uh, cited in the Bollywood movie Mission Mangal, and also in the Hollywood movie Space Moms. It is indeed a great honor and pleasure and very apt that uh, we have uh, Mrs. Nandini Harinath delivering the fourth Dr. Viva Choudhury Memorial Lecture. With this uh, few words, uh, I will now uh, request uh, uh, Mrs. Harinath to take over. Ms. Harinath, please. Um, respected uh, uh, Director PRL, uh, Dean PRL, and uh, all the colleagues in PRL and all of uh, all of those uh, who are attending this webinar, uh, warm good evening to all of you, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Director PRL and Dean PRL, for uh, inviting me for this lecture. Uh, I'm really honored, and uh, uh, I should say, absolutely overwhelmed uh, because it's specially uh, uh, you know dedicated to Dr. Biba Chaudhary. So uh, you know. Many years back, as we were growing up, um, a lot of people would ask, uh, you know, do you know any women scientists? And uh, the only name probably most of us, including me, uh, could think of was Madam Curie. Uh, but, you know, and I should also confess my ignorance when you uh, mentioned uh, uh, this to be uh, Dr. Biba Chaudhary's memorial lecture. I was um, like, I immediately Googled her. And then I realized, oh my God, here is a woman, uh, you know, in the pre-independence era who did uh, physics and then uh, she did her PhD from University of Man Manchester and uh, with so much of research and we didn't know about her at all. Uh, I So I, um, you know, considering that she worked in India's most prestigious institute after her return and um, uh, I should compliment all of you for organizing this memorial lecture. I think that's the best way we can pay homage to her and all to her work. Uh, so uh, with that, let me just start about uh, uh, talking about the work and the topic for today. Uh, thank you so much again for this kind introduction. Uh, I've been into mission design and mission operations uh, for a long time now. Uh, but, uh, you know, mission planning and operations, they play a very crucial role in uh, ensuring the effectiveness and the life of uh, these satellites in space, even though, you know, we work on a very optimized satellite design when the hardware is built, uh, but we mission planners anticipate and accommodate all possible potential deficits and you, we manage the resources that we have on the satellite very efficiently to maximize the satellite's performance. Additionally, uh, here at uh, our center, uh, my team here, we constantly monitor, you know, all of ISRO's uh, 28 satellites right now today, uh, as on today, uh, their health and uh, swiftly respond to any onboard anomalies. Uh, we have a lot of uh, diagnostic tools and then wherever necessary, we take appropriate action. So this not only mitigates the risk, but it also extends the lifespan of all of our satellites, uh, fulfilling their mission objectives. Uh, so I must say that mission planning and operation, which serves as a backbone uh, for all our satellite missions, uh, enabling us to adapt to the challenges and meet the mission goals and uh, deliver uh, the services from space. So um, 
you know, uh, generally, you know, before I actually go to ISRO, uh, this is one thing that I'd like to say. Uh, we all know that the world owes uh, the invention of zero and decimal system to India. We've had great astronomers uh, like Varaha, Miriha, Aryabhata, and Bhaskara, to name, just name a few. We've all seen the Jantar Mantar, and we knew that our ancient mathematicians, uh, we could predict the eclipses, we knew the circumference of the Earth, we knew exactly the planetary positions. And, uh, you know, not to mention, um, uh, you know, when we, I actually uh, was reading again about uh, Kalidasa's Megaduta, uh, which I think there's a lot of uh, analogy to the modern day navigation. So uh, when Yaksha wanted to send messages to his uh, wife in the Himalayas, uh, there were no GPS signals, uh, but he kind of used, you know, described the mountains and the clouds and the beautiful nature around uh, uh, to navigate and use them as signals, you know, to send uh, his uh, um, uh, his messages. So, uh, so these concepts were uh, pretty much there in ancient India, but now moving forward to the modern uh, India and uh, ISRO's programs, uh, this is just to, you know, give an overview picture of what we do at ISRO. We have this launch vehicle program where we have the PSLV, GSLVs, and we have the Mark C, and more recently we have uh, the reusable launch vehicle, and we've done quite a few tests on this. And uh, coming to the satellites, we have different types of satellites, uh, remote sensing, communication, scientific satellites. Uh, now we ventured into interplanetary missions. We have navigation satellites. And uh, we have the upcoming uh, human space flight program. Uh, and we're going to see the first uh, unmanned mission uh, this year. Um, so, you know, uh, if you look at it uh, from the distance perspective, uh, we've gone from uh, low Earth uh, missions, uh, which have an, uh, which are an altitude of 500 to 900 kilometers. We've gone to the geostationary orbits. Uh, then we went to the moon and, of course, the Mars. And, uh, okay, the farthest, as I say, 225 million, the farthest distance, uh, the satellite uh, was was nearly 400 million uh, kilometers. So uh, again, uh, looking at a broader perspective and see how uh, to see how we matured over the period of time, uh, we 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 have this small satellite program which can be made quickly at very low cost, and then we have our regular uh, Earth observation satellites. Uh, which are constantly looking at the Earth for various, uh, uh, covering various uh, mission objectives and uh, scientific applications. Then we have our own um, Navic satellite system. Uh, all of us are familiar with GPS. We all use the GPS day in and day out and we never go out without our phones and navigation. So very soon we're going to have uh, our own uh, Navic uh, satellite system giving us the portion information even in the mobiles I hear. Um, then we have our own uh, communication satellites, and then we have our interplanetary missions, um, missions to Mars, uh, and then to look at how we actually developed over the period of time. Uh, like when we launched the first satellite, uh, um, uh, our remote sensing satellite, uh, you know, it had a resolution of one kilometer. That was the best or one pixel size, or that was the best uh, distance that you could see uh, from space and to distinguish between two points. But today we are talking of uh, resolutions of 25 centimeters. Uh, this is both in our uh, radar imaging satellites and in our optical satellites. And um, when it comes to temporal resolution, like if we, you know, the older missions, if we had seen a point, we would see the point, same point again after 24 days. So that was the best revisit we had. But today we have a capability to revisit the uh, a point within two hours. And uh, in terms of spectral resolution too, we've gone a long way from seven bits to 14 bits. So uh, this is how we've matured. And I'm going to speak about a few of these satellites and, uh, you know, and being a mission designer, emphasize more on the way we plan the mission and the mission objectives uh, rather than the satellite design itself. Uh, now, you know, um, we also launched, uh, apart from our remote sensing satellites, uh, we also have 
start our own uh, uh, space uh, science experiment satellites. So it started with the Aryabhata, then we've gone on, we've had this Ross series. Uh, and then I think the best and the most, most um, trailblazing, I think, for ISRO was the Chandrayaan 1. And the discovery of water was something that excited everybody and persuaded us to look into more missions to the moon. And um, uh, uh, subsequently, we had the Chandrayaan 2, Chandrayaan 3, and then uh, we all know that we did the Mars Orbiter mission. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that because, you know, those, those were one of these uh, missions that uh, I was uh, very much involved in. Uh, now, in order to speak, you know, let me first talk about the Chandrayaan 3 because this is fresh in our memory. I'm sure all of you have read and you're all watching it live uh, when the landing happened. Uh, but just to give uh, the mission perspective or the inside story of how we carry out, uh, out the mission operations here at ISTRAC. Um, so the, the intention or the objective of the mission was to do a, a, a soft landing. Uh, and we were coming after a failure that we had uh, in Chandrayaan 2. So, you know, many people say yeah, that we were not successful uh, in the soft landing. Uh, but I must tell you at this point of time, uh, Chandrayaan 2 was hugely successful in terms of the data it gave and also in terms of the contribution that it made to Chandrayaan 3 landing. So the entire landing uh, surface and the moon surface was um, captured by the Chandrayaan-2 uh, with one of the best resolution uh, cameras that we had on board Chandrayaan-2. It's called the OHRC. In fact, uh, the you know many international missions, including the recent uh, SLIM mission, uh, ask us to map their landing sites and the areas that they are interested uh, because Chandrayaan-2 still has the best resolution camera. So these images are very much in demand. So now coming back to Chandrayaan 3, all of us know that we had uh, we had the propulsion module. There was a small change in the design, the way we did the propulsion module last time to this time. And then there was the landing module. And then we had good number of payloads because the uh, the intention was not just to do a soft landing on the moon, also to derive the best possible science that we could, uh, given the uh, given the resources that we had. So. Um, so you know, to, uh, looking at the mission profile, uh, we had the we had the LVN three Mark IV, uh, which lifted the Chandrayaan from uh, to an elliptical orbit of 170 by nearly 36,000 kilometers, and then the launch vehicle had put it in an earthbound orbit. And then the satellite had to do a series of maneuvers. Uh, you must be familiar with this earthbound maneuvers. We did this typically in uh, Chandrayaan 2 and 1 and even in the Mars Orbiter mission. So every time the satellite comes closer to the perilune, uh, we would uh, fire the thrusters to give the satellite more energy and make the orbit bigger and bigger uh, so that eventually it goes towards the moon. And uh, once it goes towards the moon, it needs to get captured into the moon's orbit. And then you need to do this lunar burns to again decelerate a little bit and then get captured around the moon and then make it a closer and closer orbit around the moon. So, and then the next phase uh, was the power descent. Uh, I'll be showing you a few slides on that. And then the most exciting part after the landing was the rover movement and the signs that the rover collected. Um, so, yeah, these were the payloads uh, that we had. Uh, we had a Langmo probe, we had the Chaste, uh, we had the LIBS, uh, uh, and then uh, we had an X-ray spectrometer um, and the shape payload. So, I mean, uh, uh, these were pretty much uh, a, a, a very good science experiment payloads, which were there both on the lander and on the rover. Um, so coming back to the mission profile, uh, like I explained, uh, we had this uh, uh, earthbound phase and then uh, the moon-centric phase. 
so uh, this is give, this is to give you an overall picture of what happened uh, in the entire mission so uh, the launch was on july 14th as all of you know and then we had the series of four earthbound manuals and we had this very critical manual called the translunar insertion on the july 31st uh, wherein it had to be done extremely precisely it was more like a rendezvous problem to go and in with a direction and a velocity to go exactly reach the perilune of the moon uh, on August 5th so that we could do a, a, a lunar burn to get captured around the moon. So, um, uh, you know, though it looks like there's a lot of numbers, you can actually see from, uh, you know, I'm pointing the my mouse uh, that the apogee with every, uh, every or the uh, upper loon with every man were kept on increasing. And then eventually uh, when we did this translunar insertion, uh, it was almost the distance of the moon at that point of time. And then you can see in the lunar burns how we actually reduced uh, the distance and made uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the upper loon uh, very 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 close and made it a circular orbit very close to the moon surface, just ideal for the moon landing. So, um, so I'll explain this a little more. Uh, this is actually not any simulation, but these are actual uh, data from the telemetry and the orbit information that we got. Uh, so on July 20 that you can see we were doing this manuals around the Earth. Uh, the green lines are the the, the manuals that already the, the, the path that the spacecraft uh, had taken and the blue dotted lines are the reference path that the satellite would take. And uh, then here you can see on July 25th, we were approaching the translunar insertion day. Uh, we were covering uh, uh, more and more of, of ground. And then you can see after the July, uh, July 31st, the translunar insertion on August 4th, how the satellite was approaching the moon. And this is exactly, I mean, like I said, this is actual telemetry data. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see that, uh, again on uh, August 5th when we did the first lunar orbit insertion or the lunar burn, uh, we were close to the moon. Uh, so again, these are the moon bound manoeuvres. Uh, we were really far away uh, from the moon on one side uh, when we did the first burn. And as we did the burns every time, uh, we got closer and closer to the moon. And um, so this is how the burns happened. And uh, uh, yeah, so there was one important event on August 17th. Uh, so, you know, unlike last time, uh, this time the propulsion module uh, kind of carried the lunar, uh, the landing module uh, piggyback. And then once its job uh, it had done, it had reached the circular orbit around moon. Uh, these two modules, the propulsion module and the landing module had to get separated. And uh, this event uh, was monitored closely in visibility and was extremely critical for us. And we had to not only ensure that they separated, we had to ensure that they were in safe distance of each other so that, you know, they would, their paths would not cross again. Uh, so all those studies were done and simulations were done. And then this was like when the uh, lander was on its own, the lander was named as Vikram. Vikram was its, on its own. It started doing the deboost maneuvers. It again had the capability to do the maneuvering. And then from the circular orbit, uh, it came to an orbit of 25 kilometer by 134 kilometer uh, by doing again the deboost maneuvers and it was ready for the landing. So this is one famous, I think, graph, which all of you must have seen. Uh, either on the TV or in many, many presentations. Uh, so this was the landing profile. Uh, so we had the sequence called the autonomous landing sequence where the, the entire landing 
sequence had to be done autonomously by the lander. There was absolutely no ground intervention. So the only thing that it required was the point at which it was to do the, the start of the landing. That position and velocity had to be very accurately known. So that there was a precision and there was a uh, accuracy requirement and, at the starting point. And the velocity uh, at the starting point was something like 1.68 kilometers per second. If I have to convert it into kilometers per hour, um, it's more than 6,000 kilometers per hour, like 100 times more than what we probably traveled on Bangalore roads or Ahmedabad roads. So, um, so from that kind of speed, uh, we had to bring it down to zero speed for a soft landing. And like all of you know very well, moon has no atmosphere and this entire reduction in velocity had to be done by the engines that uh, that were there on the lander. And the, and, the, and the criticality of this whole thing was that, uh, you know, though it was in an autonomous mode, it had to make all the decisions itself. So it had to know its position and velocity at various you know, various milestones, it had to correct for its position and velocity. And then, you know, there were altimeters, there was uh, both microwave and optical altimeters, which were telling its position. There were velocity meters, which were telling, there were, you know, velocity measurements by uh, cameras, which were telling it, its velocity. And then after it did the majority of the breaking in the rough breaking phrase, it would take all the updates from this absolute sensors to correct for its position. And then at the end of the fine breaking phase, the horizontal and the vertical velocity had to be zero. So this was the criticality of the entire landing sequence. And then more than anything else, while it did this vertical descent, we had to ensure you know, even though we knew we had got absolute updates from the sensors, all these sensors and in instruments have their own inherent inaccuracies. And what if the updates did not come? So there were so many software paths in this autonomous landing sequence to ensure that any failure either in the engines or in the sensors would be taken care of. And we would ensure that we had a soft landing. So while the vertical descent happened, um, we also had cameras, uh, you know, hazard detection cameras, which would directly look down below the landing point and ensure that we had no craters and boulders at the point on which we were we were supposed to land and in case in case it had found a crater or a boulder by this camera we would have done a retargeting and fortunately for us here um, we didn't have to do any retargeting though we reached the retargeting position and we landed very safely so uh, this was the landing sequence and this is the landing sequence in more detail so uh, this is like i think something that all of you saw uh, the landing uh, uh, through the animation of course uh, again, you know, a lot of people ask me that whatever you showed there on the display that day, uh, was it animation or was it, uh, uh, what was that we saw? So I just want to clarify to all of you, it's just the model of the, the lander was animation. But what you saw was actual telemetry data that was acquired by all our ground stations and fed to the software which computed this position and velocity. And so what you actually saw was the actual tel telemetry data. It is just that the picture in which we represented the lander was a, was a model. Um, so, you know, uh, they say that the picture is worth a thousand words. So even though uh, we mission designers and the mission team and the project team were pouring onto the various parameter, like few thousands of uh, telemetry parameters that were coming, there is nothing better than, you know, visually seeing that we were close to the moon surface. So we had this cameras, uh, the lander imaging cameras, and they were mounted very strategically and very intelligently to capture, you know, the moon surface and the solar panel so that we would get uh, the, the scalability we would we would understand as we were approaching the moon surface uh, the, the the data and the surface got clearer and clearer 
clearer and we would see it relative to the uh, the solar panel so uh, as we landed uh, right from the 30 kilometers point till the touchdown every 4 seconds we were acquiring uh, we were taking pictures and these pictures were related to our uh, ground station here uh, in um, Bailalu uh, and uh, New Norcia in Australia. They were getting processed in near real time and we were sending this back uh, to our mission control center and in real time, near real time, we were, uh, we were showing this uh, uh, displays to the entire world. So, um, you know, these are some of the pictures just as we landed, we could see and then there were pictures of uh, the rover coming out. Um, uh, you know, this was an undeniable evidence to the world that uh, uh, we had a successful uh, soft lunar landing. And uh, and then, you know, the, the rover too had uh, cameras and uh, the rover was taking picture of the lander and the lander was taking picture of the rover. And uh, these are some of the pictures uh, that we saw. And um, uh, this is typically the displays that all of you saw that was developed by uh, in-house by our extract team uh, on the, for the landing day, especially for the landing day. Uh, then moving on, you know, after the story of the successful soft landing, uh, the next came the rover rover movement and the rover path landing. So this is again another very interesting and uh, very very, very I must say, challenging uh, 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 part of the mission because you know you you just had two ca two cameras which were which were the eyes for the rover. So the rover had to take pictures uh, with this uh, camera. We call we call them the nav cams, and they were placed you know with at certain angles so that when you take a picture, the overlapping zone. Uh, we could create a digital elevation model. So when uh, so you take a picture, create a dem, uh, receive it on the ground, process it, create a dem, and then understand and create this, you know, uh, the three-dimensional geometry and understand where the craters are, where the boulders are, and then make a strategy to move. So there were many teams and uh, a lot of young people who did some excellent work across the centers uh, and this uh, rover path planning and the rover movement was done. And so typically you can see uh, the pictures on the right. Uh, you could see uh, you can see two uh, big craters that we had encountered as we had approached this crater. And uh, you know this rover again, uh, it, why the whole path planning was complex was the rover had to communicate to the lander and the lander had to communicate to the ground on the earth. So it was, in fact, you know, there were a lot of inherent delays uh, in which, you know, the data was actually received from the rover images, then transmitted and the similar path for, uh, you know, when people sitting here in the mission control center were asking the rover to move, it again had to go through the lander. So this was basically the design. And then, you know, there were like many, many interesting things that happened in those 14 days. And you can see here in the right corner picture, uh, the tracks of the rover. And there was like one interesting story that happened like, you know, it's always a conflict between the scientists and the engineers, they say. Uh, the scientists wanted us to move closer to the craters because obviously the craters would have spewed a lot of good minerals and you know there's a lot of science around the craters but the engineers of course we have a fear because we want we don't want to go very close and you know get into the risk of falling into a crater so uh, so uh, then when one such occasion we had gone very close to a crater and and then we thought we could cross the crater crater when then we realized when we took pictures that it was pretty deep then we did a, a rotation we did a turn we thought we could go on the other side we took another picture and we found again you know we had we were kind of surrounded by craters on all three sides and we had no choice but to retreat so uh, this is like i show you some pictures of the retreat uh, the rover did it went forward and came back and um, yeah, so you can see this rover tracks again and uh, uh, you can actually, you know, you can see in this uh, left corner picture, the rovers are, rover was actually uh, twisting and turning and twirling uh, on the surface. And um, 
Yeah, and coming back to again the mission design, like me, we mission designers, like I said in our introduction, we're always worried about contingencies and but plan B, plan C, plan D. So what if you know you got into a situation wherein you cannot communicate with the lander? Then for in such case, uh, we are also planned to you know have a communication path through our Chandrayaan true orbiter, and we actually tested this. So uh, we would send a command and receive telemetry to the lander using uh, the Chandrayaan two through the Chandrayaan two. So this is just to show you know the kind of planning uh, that went uh, looking and uh, you know looking at all possible uh, contingency scenarios. So now coming back to the ground station, you know, as much as the rover and the lander did its job, uh, the ground elements also were extremely complicated. We had three agencies and we had 28 terminals tracking this uh, Chandrayaan uh, 3. And, uh, you know, each of this um, uh, 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 different agencies, uh, the Swedish Corporation and the ESA and the JPL had their own way of doing things. You know, the ICDs between them, uh, the interfaces between their ground station, the communication links and redundancies with each of these stations. It was an extremely complicated affair, even to, to schedule all these stations so that you know we have enough backup plan for every single important operation. So that was the complex uh, part of this ground station. And in fact, uh, you could see how they were spread across the world, uh, the stations. And uh, this is just a bird's eye view of uh, our own D32 antenna. For those who have not seen uh, uh, come to Bangalore, please do come and visit us. This is something that has to be seen. It's a huge antenna, maybe the size of a swimming pool, if I had to find an analogy. Uh, it can actually you know, receive data from 400 million uh, kilometers. We've used it extensively for our Mars orbiter mission and, of course, our uh, uh, lunar missions. We are, as I speak, uh, we are also supporting uh, this intuitive uh, machines you know this is uh, the launches today should be happening anytime now uh, by spacex they are going to send a probe to the uh, the moon and uh, as of now we are supporting uh, their uh, as i speak uh, our antenna is supporting their mission and um, this is uh, this is the close up of the d32 antenna and this is, you know, for those of you who haven't really come here, this is uh, uh, the mission operations complex. And uh, this is a picture of how uh, the our rocket uh, LVM-3, and this is how majestically the Chandrayaan took off. And uh, uh, this is the NCC at Shar. Uh, again, this is one of the memorable pictures. Uh, the Chandrayaan 2, uh, the mission planners had planned such that as soon as the landing happened, within 20 minutes, we would ensure that the Chandrayaan 2 flies over the landing area. And we got a picture of uh, the lander from our Chandrayaan 2. So, uh, and these are more pictures. And yeah, this is the picture at the bottom where you can see the backtrack I was talking about. Uh, when we came back, uh, we did a reverse. And uh, this is exactly how uh, the rover moved. Uh, we called, uh, the Prime Minister called the point as uh, Shiv Shakti point. And uh, I think the rover uh, did more than 100 uh, meters in terms of movement. Uh, this is, you know, this is a, uh, the lander velocity camera, horizontal velocity camera, the, uh, the camera with which, which gave the updates for the velocity uh, during the descent. It was also used in the moonbound phase to take pictures. Now, let me go quickly from Chandrayaan 2 to other missions. Um, so this is, uh, again, the crater was telling you where we encountered craters on all three sides. Uh, this is the retreat uh, that we did in close up. And again, more pictures of the rover. Uh, these are the tracks. And uh, this is a three dimensional. If you have these glasses, uh, you could actually feel the surface of uh, the Chandrayaan 3. And this is again very historical because you can see Indian emblem and the flag on the rover. Many of these pictures are available on our website too. And um, 
these are more pictures uh, yeah let me move forward um, we did a very nice experiment called the hawk uh, wherein we proved uh, to the world that it's just not landing. We even have had a capability of a small takeoff. Like we, you know, at after almost uh, the end of the 14th uh, day or the lunar day, uh, we did an experiment where we fired the engines again and the lander just took off and then came down on its own. So uh, just to ensure that things were fine and uh, the legs had the capability to come back again and land again. So you can see that there was a small displacement in the in the position uh, of the lander after this hop experiment. Yeah, there you can see this hop experiment and how the position had changed. Uh, yeah, these are like, I think I skipped the, the payload part. They were like very, very interesting uh, payloads. And uh, I'm sure many of you, because uh, you are all in PRL, would have uh, gone through the results and uh, director PRL was chairing the committee and looking at all the signs that is coming from the payload. Uh, the initial results that we heard from them are that we captured some uh, seismic activity which we could not uh, really understand or attribute to any of the movement on the lunar surface. I'm sure people are looking at it more in more detail now. And this was like something that uh, kind of captured all our imagination and like we were all awestruck by this graph that the science team showed us uh, that just within a depth of 10 centimeters, uh, you know, there just measured a temperature variation of 60 on the surface. And just within 10 centimeters down, it measured minus 10. So this is something I think I'm sure people are looking at it in more detail. But this is something that excited all of us uh, from uh, the outside. Yeah, and these are like more elements that were found uh, uh, by the by the science team, by the LIBS. Uh, now, let me just move on. Let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Aditya and how we planned the mission. Uh, again, Aditya had this a very exciting seven payloads and uh, was set to go to the uh, Elven point. Elven point is a point which is uh, 1.5 billion kilometers away. It's 1% of the distance to the sun. And that's a point wherein you get uh, which wherein you have the gravitational forces of the Earth, Sun, and the Moon nullifying. So any satellite there will have a constant view of the of the Sun, and with small maneuvers, we are able to be in a halo orbit uh, uh, around the L1. L1 is just a purely imaginary point. There's absolutely no object there in L1, but still the satellite would go about this imaginary point called L1 uh, in a halo orbit. So. So that was the challenging thing about uh, Aditya and you know there's still a lot of things going on in Aditya. Today we had this uh, uh, well cooperation, the door was opened and uh, we took a picture and we're still awaiting for the data download at 5 p.m. today and all of these uh, payloads are being operated and uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of science outcome that is going to come in the uh, near future. And uh, again, you know, uh, the Aditya 2 had to do this earthbound maneuvers uh, to get that energy to escape from the Earth's gravity and go towards the L1. And, uh, you know, the most, uh, you know, as mission planners, one of the most exciting thing here was the launch vehicle had to do a long posting. Uh, because it had this very, very, very difficult AOP requirement. Because, you know, when, because the, the sun and earth are constantly in motion, uh, the point at which it would leave the earth to reach the L1 point, that was fixed. And for a given launch date, that point would vary. So, uh, in order to inject the satellite at the perigee point, that, 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 that condition of the having the appropriate argument of perigee became a constraint on the launch vehicle. And the launch vehicle had to do a long posting like what you see here uh, to get that AOP. And uh, this was challenging, you know, from the ISTRAC perspective, uh, we had to send a, 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 a transportable terminal, an antenna on a ship uh, to the Pacific 
to track the launch vehicle. And then there was another transportable uh, terminal sent to Fiji uh, because Fiji cannot have a does not have a regular ground station. And so these uh, locations became critical just to track the launch vehicle. Uh, so the rest of the story, I'm sure all of you have heard about Aditya, uh, how we got captured into this hello orbit on January 6th. And uh, you know, there are plenty of uh, uh, maneuvers that are going to be planned, you know, just to nudge the satellite a little bit to, so that it stays in the halo orbit. Uh, just to give you a feel of, you know, how the earthbound maneuvers were done, you can see this earthbound maneuvers were done and then it went, did this long, long coast uh, to get into this uh, halo orbit uh, uh, on the um, uh, 6th of Jan this year. So yeah, so now let me talk a little bit of about Mars mission. Uh, I, that was the time I had a lot of interaction with uh, Director PRL, who was one of our uh, payload PIs. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who think, you know, why go to Mars and why, you know, spend so much money? This, this is a question a lot of people ask. And, uh, you know, like uh, it's not just I think about uh, 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 exploration. There were many, many spin-off technologies. There are a lot of things that we learned uh, after the Mars mission. I think the best part about Chandrayaan and Mom was, you know, to uh, this stoke this uh, young Indians' uh, interest in uh, engineering and astronomy. So uh, off late, I've seen. So many people, you know, uh, very, very young, even in the remotest corner of the country uh, who heard about uh, this missions. Um, and I think in that sense, uh, these missions uh, achieved much, much more than what they had intended to. Uh, just to tell you a personal story, recently we got a painting done and the painter who is probably not even educated, a very young guy, must be 18 years, uh, he saw this model of Chandrayaan sitting in my shelf and he said, uh, ma'am, uh, isn't this Chandrayaan? Like, I was amazed. Like, how did this guy recognize Chandrayaan? And more than anything, he wanted a picture of uh, himself with the Chandrayaan. So, you know, that is the kind of interest it evoked, you know, if, if, if it evoked that kind of interest in a painter. So you can actually imagine the kind of interest it has uh, evoked in the students and uh, the younger uh, community. Um, so, yeah. So uh, the Mars and Earth are pretty much similar in many ways in terms of how it is inclined to the ecliptic. You know, the day on Mars is very similar to day on Earth, but then the similarity ends there. And, uh, you know, a lot of the, the most challenging thing about the Mars mission was the time we had to actually work on this mission. Uh, for, I don't know, various reasons, the project approval came just before uh, 18 months bit, uh, before the launch window. And this Mars missions have this very peculiar launch windows, which come only once in two years, because that is the most optimal time. And any other time you launch, uh, you will not be optimal in terms of either fuel or in terms of time. So this was also our first interplanetary mission. None of us had any experience whatsoever working on an interplanetary mission. So right from understanding the orbit dynamics, the spacecraft, the, the navigation part, the trajectory design, everything was new. And I think the, one of the most challenging things about this mission was the, the autonomy and the mission planning. So, uh, so this is how the spacecraft looked, and uh, we had uh, five science payloads. Uh, again, there was a lot of constraint in terms of weight, volume, power. Not much was available for the science payload, but here again, the objective was to show to the world that we had this capability to get into the Martian orbit. So, um, so then uh, the mission design actually was extremely challenging and there were like many many occasions in this mission wherein we felt we had not really anticipated those issues but then the team was like you know it was so well uh, they came up with so many solutions on the fly and we had this extraordinary capability to gear up for this unplanned events so i think that was one of the thing uh, things that actually made this mission extremely uh, successful and uh, 
you know to uh, just tell you the basically the trajectory itself you had four body and you had to convert this four, four body problem to a two body problem and the the trajectory design itself was done totally in house by our flight dynamics team and that in fact uh, proved that uh, you know we had this capability for designing any mission uh, any interplanetary mission in fact so one thing is to design the trajectory and you know do it on paper but then the challenge is when you are actually traversing the path how do you know that you are on the right trajectory so knowing the position or you know navigation itself was one of this very important things so this is like a favorite slide for all of us who you know present uh, uh, on the mars mission how we targeted a pillbox of 50 kilometers from a distance of 225 million so the the accuracy with which the spacecraft had to leave the earth uh, to reach that pillbox of 50 kilometers in terms of position and velocity was amazing and then uh the the various techniques and uh, the delta differential one way ranging uh, uh was also developed in house and uh, we could prove that uh, we could we were able to predict the position and correct for this uh, position of the satellite in this uh, coasting phase very precisely so uh moving on to autonomy you know the the light time itself takes about 22 minutes each way uh, for the signals to reach mars and then come back and then like this gamut of radiation and you have to pick up this signal a very very faint signal among this huge noise and uh, the the ground, both the ground station antenna and the onboard receiver uh, the kind of sensitivity it had to pick up this uh, signal and then you know make you know remove all the noise and make a meaningful signal out of it so uh, this was another extremely big challenge and then uh, to make things worse uh, you know this this all these bodies are in constant motion and sometimes the sun would come exactly physically in block as uh, you know with respect to the mars and you cannot see the satellite because it has gone behind the sun and uh, this this period would last about 14 days wherein for all the 14 days the satellite had to be on its own and without any interference from the earth or, or from the ground uh, here so um, similarly we had white out geometry uh, where sun is behind the satellite and we still could not communicate to the satellite so all this things had to be taken care and entire autonomy was designed and developed and built so that the satellite had this capability to totally take care of uh, on its own even not only in the nominal condition but in case during this time it it encountered any uh, failure uh, the satellite had this capability to come back and revive uh, and then uh, and then and then communicate back to the earth so uh, this was un, you know when i was talking of uh, this uh, unexpected event there was this uh, uh, comet uh, uh, siding spring which came uh, out of the blue and we hadn't really anticipated this and uh, uh, we had to duck from the comet because the comet shaft could have been uh, uh, very difficult for the satellite and it could have hit the satellite so we had to do a maneuver uh, to duck from the comet and like while the comet was approaching we had to be on the other side of the plan uh, of the of the mars and then we also got an opportunity we got a very very faint picture of the comet uh, using our camera and this is some of the nice images that we took uh, from our mom is also uh, you know we had this uh, color camera and it's always nice to show these pictures uh, mom is a home to many of uh, the biggest volcanoes and uh, we could capture many of these uh, and mom kind of exceeded uh, its life by many many times it was supposed to be a short mission but it almost lived 8 years so um, then you know i just i take couple of minutes right now i think we are out of time i'll talk about uh, you know the future we've all talked about interesting missions in the past we're going to have a very very interesting mission called nisar in the coming months and um, this is a collaborative uh, uh, effort between nasa and isro and nisar is going to tell you everything about the ecosystem 
about how the ice caps are melting, about uh, the, the, the sea level rise, about the forestry, the greenery, the Arctic, the polar regions. So uh, it is basically meant for the ecosystem. And the, the most exciting part of NISAR is this huge antenna, which is 12 meter in diameter. Huge, I must say, maybe bigger than the room I'm sitting, and a nine meter boom. And um, and the best part is it comes with a new technology called SleepSAR technology, wherein we get a wide swath of 240 kilometers with the best resolution of three meters. So this is the first time any satellite is going to be using this uh, SleepSAR technology. And it's also been a great learning experience working with JPL. Um, I worked on this mission for close to almost 11 years now. And uh, right now I'm not there on it, but till the time I came to its strike, I was also working on this mission. It is something that all of us are going to be looking forward to. And there's another very, very uh, exciting thing about this mission is this mission is going to be flying in a diamond. In the sense, the orbit control for this mission is going to be so tight that if you can imagine a tube around the Earth, at uh, 747 kilometers altitude, the satellite has to be within the tube, which is just 250 meters wide and 325 meters in in height. So the the orbit control for this is going to be extremely tight, and we as mission designers are going to have this. Uh, we're going to prove uh, that we have this capability to keep the satellite within a tight control. And another very very interesting uh, feature of this is this deployment of this huge antenna. So we're going to take about five to six days, and slowly you can see how we call it as a risk. Uh, so this again deployment is totally done by JPL and the hardware, the reflector, the boom, uh, it belongs to JPL, but the entire mission operations are going to be carried out here at this track where we work. And uh, so this is something that all of us are going to be looking forward to. So my last few slides are on the human space program. I'll just take about another five minutes. So we're going to have this exciting uh, mission called TVD1, wherein uh, we're going to fly a configuration very close to the uh, manned mission, but this is going to be unmanned. So um, basically, you know, we had, uh, I don't know, many, not many people would remember, way back in 2007, we did a mission called uh, SRE, Space Capsule Reentry Experiment, of which like I was one of the uh, key members in this mission. We actually, the satellite went to an altitude of more than 500 kilometers and it stayed there for 13 days and then it act, did a re-entry. Uh, you can see this uh, profile of re-entry. Uh, it, um, it, it, it had parachutes and then it was recovered on the Bay of Bengal. Uh, it had a flotation system. Uh, there were a lot many exciting moments when we did this mission. Uh, we had actually lost the contact with the satellite when it actually fell in the ocean. And then uh, uh, we later found that uh, it was just a momentary pause when one of this, uh, the beacon from which uh, the, we were supposed to get the signal at the impact point had not given us the signal. Uh, but we found this uh, capsule majestically floating uh, you know, exactly at the place where it had to, it was meant to re-enter. And uh, the challenging part again was this thermal protection when the spacecraft enters the atmosphere, it goes through this uh, uh, phase wherein the entire, uh, the, there's a plasma created around the, uh, around the uh, capsule and you cannot communicate uh, to the capsule for a couple of minutes and it and experiences uh, this high temperatures of more than 2000 degrees centigrade and it has to sustain the temperature and you know and remain intact for all the other elements uh, which are uh, related to the deceleration, the parachutes and the other things to open up. So our Gaganyan is also going to be based on you know similar philosophy. We have a, a crew model, a service model, and an orbital model module. And then we have this new element called the crew escape system. Just in case, just after liftoff, if there is any kind of contingency that happens, then because a human is in uh, in the module, uh, the crew escape system just ejects from the main module and it has its own autonomous uh, 
uh, features wherein it can open parachutes and then it has a flotation system and it can be recovered. So uh, this is just in case there is an emergency abort. So last year, actually, we uh, you must have all read that and seen on TV that we tested this crew escape system uh, and then. Yeah, so. Uh, so then, you know, what are the challenges? Uh, I won't spend too much time, but I just want to tell you all that it's going to be an extremely complicated mission, not just for this people who make the spacecraft, but for all the planners on the ground. For example, you, you we will have 26 gro ground stations which will be tracking and each of these, uh, the launch vehicle and uh, the spacecraft will have four carriers each. And, you know, each of, and then you will have two different control centers which will have redundancy, you will have something at East Track, you will have again another control center at Shar, and each of this ground station will be con uh, talking to this control center with you know three different links. So you will probably have 78 links and you will have data from everywhere coming in. And then, you know, because the, uh, the human life is involved, you will have triple redundancy at every point in the ground segment chain. <laughs> you will have number of shipbone terminals, you will have a very complicated spacecraft with every element, a hardware will have multiple, a quadrupole redundancy. You will have four computers, you will have uh, four receivers, everything will be quadrupole. So uh, this is something that, uh, uh, this is just, you know, to give you a flavor of what Gaganyan is going to be, a uh, human space program. So uh, total capacity is over eight tons. Uh, we will be getting into an orbit of 400 kilometers uh, with 51 degree uh, inclination. And uh, again, the launch vehicle itself is extremely complicated and different. Uh, we are going to have this crew escape system. And again, you know, quadrupole redundancies, a different avionics. And uh, the most importantly, for the human to be there, uh, you need this N N ECLS system wherein you need to have, because the human is in vacuum, you need to have a flight, uh, the suit, uh, the pressure needs to be maintained, the, the body fluids have to be kept you know, intact, uh, not uh, uh, the temperatures, pressures, and medical emergency, management of food and waste. Uh, and more than anything else, the crew has to be trained to learn how to operate the the, the vehicle. So all this also is happening, and uh, it's again one of the most exciting missions that we are going to be uh, supporting. And just to give you a flavor of how many ground stations are involved, you can see all these stations. We are already collaborating with them. We have built interfaces with them all over the world uh, to support the human space program. And this is just again. Uh, Another very, very challenging point is, though you know you will have one impact point, which is a nominal impact point, just in case there's an abort or a malfunction or there's an emergency, we have planned 48 impact points all over the world wherein you can actually recover the module. So this is in case of uh, contingency. So you can imagine how complex this uh, program is going to be. And uh, this is ex this is just a, norm a case of a nominal descent when everything is fine, uh, how the descent is going to happen. So this is just again the profile uh, of, uh, you know, how the various uh, systems are going to operate the deceleration and flotation systems and uh, uh, and how the recovery is going to happen on the sea. Uh, with that, I say uh, thank you very much. I conclude. I just I think I see that by a couple of minutes. Thank you so much for your attention and thank you once again. Thank you. Uh, Nandini. Thank you, Nandini, for such a uh, interesting talk and you have inflated our uh, imagination and uh, we are so thrilled now to looking forward to what is going to happen. And I would request if Dr. Professor Bhardwaj would like to ask something, we'll begin with the question answers now. Thank you, Dr. Nishta, and thanks, Nandani, for a very exciting talk uh, covering very wide range of topics from planetary mission to NISA to Chandrayaan, Gaganyaan, and what is stored in future with respect to the challenges which is there. So talking about challenges, I have just one question for you, which is uh, to know you have been involved in more than 20 missions and more in store for you. Which one has been the most challenging for you personally 
okay not technically but personally and what is the new learning we got from that mission uh, so okay so that's actually a difficult uh, question it's like you know choosing between your kids <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well you know like all parents it's always the first big mission uh, that uh, really excites you though the sre was my first big mission uh, i still feel uh, the mars orbiter mission had its own uh, very very challenging situations both technically and uh, in terms of uh, attention that it demanded in terms of the kind of work that it demanded from all of us and in terms of the responsibility all of us carried on our heads and the kind of pressure i think um, it it sets everything apart okay so mom mom likes mom right <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay okay Thank you, Nista. You can carry on. Yeah. I will take up something else later on. Yeah, Professor Palam Raju wants to ask something. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Nista. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Nandini, for this wonderful and fascinating talk. Uh, you know, you, it, you are talking about several, you know, orbit uh, raising, you know, insertion and orbit decreasing maneuvers. So all, all of them so critical, and uh, you made you or means all of you make it make them look so easy that we we want you know we uh, you, we want more from you in in addition to those aspects and then thank you for reliving some of these excitements uh and the goosebump raising uh times that you are especially you know describing in terms of the chandrayaan 3 landing aspect uh, I have, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, there are a lot of, um, you know, would be many other, you know, technical questions, but I was more curious to know uh, in terms of the future uh, missions uh, to, you know, Mars and Venus that ISRO is uh, planning, uh, which is uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, are there any uh, additional you know, constraints that are there in, in terms of Venus mission or point of view, because you're going closer towards the sun and you know gravity sun is attracting uh, you know at more so in visa we just can you make a comparison you know between uh, go you know, orbit mission planning towards venus and towards mars okay so so uh, with respect to mission i think the the most critical uh, part of the venus mission would be uh, the temperatures um, from what we've read, uh, though the Venus is the second planet, it's hotter than Mercury. And um, Venus is also, you know, one rotation and revolution is exactly the same. So, uh, so, uh, so, it, uh, so dealing with uh, temperature effect and we've also heard that a lot of sulfuric acid clouds and you can't really, uh, you know, use your optical cameras and payloads so easily to do any signs on the Venus. So, uh, you know, go, going, uh, having balloons and, uh, you know, leaving the science part aside, but as mission planners, you know, planning for balloons and planning for communication uh, through this thick uh, atmosphere of the Venus and managing uh, the thermal conditions on uh, the spacecraft, uh, communicating with the Earth in all these conditions. I think Venus is going to be extremely challenging. And um, this is something that will uh, involve a lot of new technologies. I'll take one question from YouTube. Uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar Mishra is asking, please highlight in brief the telemetry error at the time of executing lander and what are the causes? So, and here's the second part also. How Mangalyan mission makes future course of Mars challenge and any ISRO plan flyby mission in Mars? He has asked two questions. Okay, so, uh, so telemetry errors, uh, we have a lot of mechanism to remove the errors. So in case there is a, a error, it will be detected right at the time the data is acquired and uh, the frame will be dropped. So uh, normally, in, especially during the landing, uh, again, there were many challenges. 
uh, we had an antenna which had a fov a smaller fov and that had to be constantly steered towards the ground station and in a predefined way i told you that it was a totally autonomous landing so this profile had to be simulated the geometry had to be simulated those angles had to be perfect the link margin you know when you talk of when you have a sufficient link margin uh, to receive the data uh, we should not have any uh, issues at all so these errors are by inherently taken care by the design itself and if our geometry and the way we operate the satellite is as expected we shouldn't get any errors at all so we also thought of you know failures uh, in the chain you know when you are talking of ground antennas any time anything can happen so what if there was heavy rain in bangalore that day and b32 lost for some reason data so we had planned a geographically part we had planned a station in australia called new narcia which was tracking the lander and which had the visibility for the entire landing sequence so we were simultaneously receiving data from our own station also from new narcia so we also take care of many such things in the planning um yeah a lot of it is taken care in the design now coming to mars flyby from what i hear from the uh, management is that the next mars mission is going to be a lander and probably a helicopter on that uh, so it's going to be a mars landing mission and not a flyby mm -hmm. and what will be the time frame you are thinking uh, probably next maybe 8 years or 6 to 8 years Yes, anybody else would like to ask? This is a chance. Yes. Yes, madam. Yes. Madam, can I ask? yes Hello, Tandini, Tandini, madam. First of all, thank you so much for such a nice talk. Uh, my question is related to your uh, is human yeah, space mission. So, ISRO is going to make the Gaganiyar. Means so that means all the technology means how it will go and how it will be handled that will be taken care by ISRO, and the people who are going who will be there, they will be from some other agency. So now how you are going to combine them means because the people who are going to actually in the uh, that space craft they should know at least few things. So how you are going to means combine them? So yeah, you must have read in the papers these astronauts are already identified and they've gone, undergone rigorous training abroad and they have been undergoing the training in ISRO for the last couple of years and uh, so uh, all of us have uh, taken like you know they've, they've conducted courses we've conducted courses for them so by now they are pretty much familiar with all the types of operations that we do on a satellite they are also familiar with the design now so uh, not just the physical training fitness medical fitness also you know orbit dynamics management of satellite every aspect of uh, the space mission and uh, they have been uh, they have been tutored and they are very much pretty good at that now so just one more thing i will add here so will there be some kind of uh, exam also for them that they have to clear yeah, that yeah. then only they can be they've already done it they were no, no, yeah. yes, some people are selected now yeah. to miss out of them who will be there who can actually handle so, so that's a difficult question they obviously there will be a selection criteria whenever it happens uh so there will be some criteria based on which they'll be selected but as of now they're all being trained okay okay thank you yes Anybody else would like to ask? So if there are no questions, I will request Dr. Pandya and uh, Pragya Pandya to give a vote of thanks. Shall I? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you, Nishtan. So uh, Nandi was talking about, you know, the coasting. So I don't know how many of you really understand coasting. So maybe Nandi, can you just explain to our audience who are not directly linked to the mission what the coasting actually means? So the launch vehicle uh, coasting? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the launch vehicle typically uh, the for any mission for let's say a low Earth orbit, uh, it takes off from uh, Sri Harikota and it takes a defined trajectory and uh, it 
uh, if it's a polar mission, it will uh, it will take a it will raise from zero slowly as the uh, uh, you know it goes through first stage, second stage, third stage, and fourth stage. It will inject the satellite close to you know on Mauritius uh, uh, if it's a polar orbit. If it's an inclined orbit, it will go you know eastward and uh, somewhere close to you know Indonesia and. Uh, uh, Australia, it would uh, it would inject the orbit. Typically, the depending on the altitude, uh, the uh, rocket would take something like 15 to 18 minutes. Now, uh, there was a, um, uh, a, a requirement that the injection of the satellite should happen all over, you know, around, you know, in the Pacific. Now, the satellite, the rocket has to carry the satellite all the way and. Uh, you know, after it has done its uh, uh, job of going to the third stage or the final stage, it will coast and simply carry the satellite without any change in the altitude. It will it will have to carry the satellite all the way to the desired point over the Pacific to inject it. That was a very strange requirement because we wanted the satellite to be there at the perigee so that by the time we do the insertion or the uh, the L1 trans L1 maneuver, the perigee would have moved to the ideal condition because the at the perigee, the satellite has to leave in a particular direction and a particular velocity. So that point is already predetermined because we know that it has to reach the sun. So if you back calculate, that point happened to be on the Pacific. So the rocket had to do this long, long, uh, uh, like, Carrying the satellite extra, you know, after it's done its job of getting the altitude uh, and velocity just to coast around to reach that point and then inject the satellite. And it also called for, you know, some new design in the uh, in the PS4 because uh, the PS4 had to restart. It had to restart a couple of times uh, to go to the, the desired location. So it was extremely challenging even for the launch vehicle team. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Nani. I think uh, this is slightly new knowledge for many of the people who are there on the WebEx and probably on the YouTube channel of PRL because Posting has been a very important aspect both for our Aditya L1 mission as well as for MOM mission. Yeah, yes, and sir. Aditya L1 was probably the longest coasting we had, right? Thank okay. you. Thank Back you. to you, Mr. Thank you, Nandi, madam. It was such an infectious talk. We'll be always grateful to having you here for this lecture. Over to Pragya. Thank you, ma'am. So, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So to begin with, I would take a moment to thank Ms. Nandini Harinath for being with us today. Ma'am, your insightful talk on the ISRO's prestigious missions left an indelible mark on everyone present here. The talk has made us more entitled and of course more proud and we did, uh, definitely share this moment for a long time. We also thank you for sparing the time uh, for question and answer sessions and explaining such complexities in the most comprehensible manner. I would also uh, like to put on record heartfelt uh, gratitude uh, to our director, Professor Adil Bharadwaj, for his support right from the institution of this lecture series to year after year execution of the same. A big thank you is due uh, for Professor D. Palam Raju, Dean PRL for his untiring efforts involved in organizing this lecture and Professor R. D. Desh Pandey, a registrar PRL for his unwavering support. I extend my thanks to the Biba Chaudhary Memorial Lecture Committee whose hard work, meticulous planning and attention to detail ensured that everything ran smoothly. I thank the CNIT team for the technical assistance. And last but not the least, I thank the participants who actually joined us today, both on WebEx and YouTube platforms for this prestigious talk. So thank you all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.